Hi, my name is Clemens Lang, and today we, not, we need to talk about your use of root privileges in containers. Um, I'll start out with a bit about me. I did study computer science in uh, southern Germany um, in 2011, got interested in open source projects while uh, doing Google Summer of Code with a MacPods project. I'm using a Mac here. Um, and after that, landed a job at BMW doing infotainment. So uh, that's where I spent seven years building infotainment for cars, first doing some software integration work, doing packaging. Um, then, and this is where uh, the connection to today's talk comes in. I, we wrote a thousand line uh, of C single binary container run, uh, runtime to simplify building software for a platform. And I got very familiar with the various namespaces involved in doing that. Um, then switched to over the uh, software updates for the entire car. I think we were the second in the market after Tesla to do that for the entire car. Um, and for the last few years, did security at BMW, CISO, Secure Boot, and um, all that, you know, SA Linux, whatever you have. Um, and that eventually brought me to Red Hat, where I now work in the crypto team. So first note, I don't do anything with containers in my day-to-day -day work, right? So this is sort of a talk from an outsider. Um, and what I'm doing at the moment is uh, I patch OpenSSL. Um, I try to get rid of SHA-1 where I can. You know, that might have fallen on some of your feet recently. One of the culprits was me, probably. And I'm also dealing with uh, FIPS certification, because that's a fun topic for everybody. So root and containers, right? Before there were containers, there was some conventional wisdom that we always applied. If you run a service, create a separate user for it, just for separation purposes, right? Um, and while, you know, then Docker came along and we started running everything as root again because that's just what Docker did, but nobody thought this was a problem. Um, and honestly, we still don't think it's a problem and it probably also isn't that big of a problem, right? So just to put the entire talk into perspective for you. Um, I brought an example here. Let's assume I create uh, a directory in varlib and then I bind mount that into a container um, that container is running as root, so I'm running the entire command as root. And inside that container, um, I just happy, happen to copy bin cat into that bind mounted directory and uh, then run a ch mod command to give it that set UID bit. Um, so that means anybody who runs that binary now will get effective root permissions. Um, and that also works outside of the container. So if I then outside of the container switch to user nobody, run that particular binary, um, and uh, give it an argument of etc shadow, then I will get the contents of that file, even though the nobody user should normally not be allowed to read that. This isn't really a surprise to anybody. Um, and it's not really a security vulnerability as is. Because you know if you bind mount stuff in, then you should know what you're doing. So this isn't a surprise. But you know, if we were running this with rootless Podman, then this wouldn't be an issue. You would still get a set UID binary, but it would be for that particular user that might not have privileges to do anything else. So we could improve by running this container as rootless Podman. Right, so running things as rootless Podman. That brings us to the issue of networking, because if you want to offer a service, then you probably want network in your container. And in Podman, in rootless Podman, there are basically two options. Either it's slurp for netNS, um, that works using a tap device, um, but has a couple of limitations. For example, you can only communicate among various containers via exposed ports on the exact same host or using the local host interface. And all the requests that you get will seem to originate from the IP address that's associated with a tap device. So you lose the information of where the request was actually coming from. And you might want to use that to filter you know, for which IP networks you offer a particular service. Then there's some improvement on top of that um, where you and essentially take slurp for netNS, put it in a user namespace that owns a network namespace, um, and then do a common typical networking using netAVARC um, after that. That's great because it now allows you to um, uh, do standard networking between containers, 
but it still uses the, the Slurp 4 net and tap device, so all requests still originate from the same IP address. So this isn't really ideal if, if we want to do is run a service. So the question that I was asking really turns into, can we run each container as a separate rootless Podman user, but with the proper networking, proper in quotes, as in the rootful networking? Right? And that's the question that I want to answer today. And so you've now seen my motivation. This is the outline for the talk. We have to talk a bit about theory, but it will be quick, I promise you. Um, and then I'll outline the various solutions that I found by following a mailing list post and a presentation somewhere in the Podman user group uh, in 2021, 20, I think. That was recently removed from the web server. Boo, I have to go to archive.org to get it now. Right, let's get into it. Some theory. Why is it that inside of the container we can even read the, the, the file that's owned by root, right? Um, to know that we need to understand how user namespaces work. User namespaces uh, separate, they basically give you a separate UID range and that UID range is mapped from inside the container to outside the container using a mapping file and this is what the, this mapping file is. You can do this with pretty much every container that uses user namespaces and essentially tells you um, zero in the container is user a thousand outside of the container and repeat this for the following number of UIDs, in this case one. And then after that one, the UID one is mapped to UID five, two, four, something, for the next 65,300 and something UIDs. Um, this is what it will typically look like on, on a modern system where you have sub UIDs. And the rule for accessing files is that containers, and I looked this up in the kernel, can't access inodes that are uh, owned by UIDs and GIDs that are not mapped inside your container. So if you don't map the UID zero, then nobody can access roots files. It's as simple as that. So that's theory part one. Theory part two is on networking. Um, for that, you need to know that any non-user namespace is associated with a particular user namespace. Um, and if you want to do an operation inside that namespace, then you need the required capabilities in that user namespace to do that. Sounds complicated, but it will be a lot easier once we get to the example. So managing a network connection requires CapNet admin. That's the capability that the Linux kernel checks when you try to modify the IP address of a device, for example. Um, if you now do this in a network namespace owned by a user namespace in which you are root, then you have that capability usually, and that action is allowed. However, changing the host's network namespace requires capnet admin in the host's user namespace, which is the root namespace that you typically don't see in configure, but it exists. And that also tells us something. Um, it tells us if we want to use the real networking, then at some point we will have to have capnet admin uh, in the root user namespace, so there's no way um, of doing any of this without using actual root. So for some pieces, we will need root. So my first idea when I was trying to do this was, um, okay, I'll start a rootful container, but Podman offers me this, this flag dash dash UID map that allows me to configure which UID mapping I actually want. So let's just not map the root user from outside into the container, and then the problem that I was um, trying to solve is solved, right? This is what these lines here do. So essentially, I'm saying zero in the container maps to the user that I am currently am outside of the container, and then the second UID map line just does the same thing with sub-UIDs, which we, we, we will ignore for now because it's, you know, we don't need to understand this to understand the, the, the concept that I'm trying to go for. So, when I prepared this talk, I reran this command, and my heart almost stopped because I, I thought, wait, this didn't used to work. And this is the error message that I used to get when I did this. Turns out this is fixed in Podman 4.5, right? So, this is what you should be doing. Thanks for coming to my TED talk. Goodbye. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, now this works, but I'm still gonna tell you what I did before it worked. 
And there might be, you know, you might learn a thing or two and you might still want to not do this particular solution, but we'll get to that. So I did some Googling. Um, I found a, a presentation that essentially said, yeah, you can run these two commands, then run, set up the uh, network manually, and that should work. Um, and here's a link to a mailing list post of a guy who uh, probably did that at some point in time. Um, and then I clicked that and, and thought, OK, this looks nice. I can probably do this. Um, and the idea here is that we, you know, all of this is as user now. So we, we are running rootless Podman. I create the container. Note create, not run or start or any of that. I create the container without networking. I give it a name because we will need that name for the, for the uh, commands that follow. Right after, I run container init. That's also an interesting command because what that does, it sets up all the namespaces but doesn't actually start anything inside your container. Um, so you have the namespaces available, then you have time to modify them, for example, to configure network, uh, which you know I did here in a script, let's call it magic.sh. And after that, I run podman start and my container starts as normal. So the question really is, what's inside this magic.sh? And it's this, and it's kind of a lot, right? Let's go through what this does. Um, I will take Podman Inspect to figure out the PID um, of the container that we initialized but didn't start. Then this next, the, the uh, sudo ln line is really just to give the network namespace a name that the IP utility from the IP route package can use. Um, and then I do what Podman initially uh, or I internally also does, which is set up a virtual ether Ethernet pair, move one side of that Ethernet pair into the container, um, then rename it into the uh, inside of the container to eth, ETH0, which is what we would expect the network's name to be, and then bring it up on both sides and configure an IP address so we can uh, have a communication going on. That is a lot of work, and note that we haven't actually, um, we haven't, well, we had to do manual IP config for this, so I had to choose an IP address and set it. Um, then Podman Inspect won't know about this because we didn't use Podman to configure the network. Um, we must repeat this every time we start the container. And I haven't yet dealt at all with exposing ports, which requires ri writing firewall rules which I really don't want to do manually. This is like tedious work. And I, yeah, I could probably write a script. Um, but at this point, I was almost, um, I, I was about to give up on this because I thought now I don't want to deal with firewall rules and exposing ports. I don't want to, um, let's just uh, run everything with root. And then I thought, how does Podman actually do this? Where's the code in Podman that creates all these network interfaces and chooses an IP address and assigns all of this? And turns out there isn't, because what Podman does, it calls netAVARC for this and just pipes a bunch of JSON into it, and netAVARC takes care of, of configuring the network interfaces, moving them into the right namespaces, and so on. So I thought, can I just, you know, create this JSON configuration, pipe it to NetAWARC, and, and it will do what I want for me? And it turns out, yes, I can. So I created a new Podman network. You can give it IP, IPv6 or not if you want to. I mean, we're, we want to get rid of legacy IP, so you should these days. Then generate the required JSON. Um, that contains the IP address that you want to give the container, so we still have that problem. Um, you that contains the exposed ports, and then pipe that to NetAVARC setup with um, a path that identifies the network namespace in which you want to do this. Um, and then that will give you in return a name server, a server configuration that you su should somehow get into the container. I was lazy, I just wrote it to etc resolve conf. Right, what does that JSON structure look like? Unfortunately, it's not documented, at least not in the NetAVARC um, uh, readmes or documentation, and also not in the Podman documentation. So I reverse engineered it, um, and uh, this is the, the rundown of what this is. It tells you, okay, I'm looking at this container ID with this container name. Here's a list of the port mappings from which container port to which host port, how many ports, which protocol. Um, and it also gives you a list of the networks that you want to attach to and which IPs um, you want inside that network and 
Um, this also gives you DNS. So you can get name resolution and the service discovery if you also specify uh, name aliases for that. And then there's this block network info um, here at the bottom that I omitted because it's really just the output of Podman inspect on the network. Right, and this is the point where I show you that this works. And let's pray to the demo gods because I'm running this over Wi-Fi. And if it doesn't work, then I have a, a TDY recording of um, me showing this. So I have two shells here on a Fedora 38 system. Can you still hear me while I'm sitting? I'm, yes, great. I have two shells here on a Fedora 38 system. One is root and one is um, the test user. And I said we want to start out as the test user, so let's do that. I want to define a runtime directory. Let's call our container rootless, and for that reason, I'm choosing that particular runtime directory. Um, then that probably doesn't exist yet, so I am going to make it. And then I'm running portman create. And this CAD file um, that I'm specifying here, I, I'll uh, explain in a second because I automated all of this. I'm not going to do it manually now for everyone. Um, runtime dir, thanks. And that expects the ID of the container in this particular path. So that's why I'm creating it. Disabling network, giving it a name. And we're starting Fedora 38. And just for the demo, we're starting a Python web server on port 8088. Right. So. This was created now. Now I need to run this um, container init command that we saw earlier. So podman container init and then the name of the container. That um, passed. And now we can see in podman ps-a that we have the container. It's in status initialized. It's not running yet. Right? So let's get the PID for this. So we can see what's going on. How am I time-wise? I probably I should probably skip some of this. Let's go to yeah. I scripted some of this, and this is the part where we need to start running things as root. So as root, I have a script here that allows me to set this up. Now I need to use the exact same runtime directory that I used here. So let me copy this and fix it because obviously id-u will return something else. Then I run setup. I specify um, a name that's used to generate an IP address. So in this case, I just use the container name again. Um, then I have a secret that I use so that the IP address isn't predictable that I'm generating. Um, test is the user that I'm running the container under. Then I want to attach this to the rootful zero network. And I ch let me quickly check that this network actually exists so we don't get an error. It exists. And I want to publish a port. That's 80 to 88. So uh, 80 is outside of the container. 80, 80 is inside of the container. And I could also specify a network alias here, but I'm not going to show you the resolution anyway, so let's just skip it. I mistyped something. This exists, and container ID exists in there. There must be a typo. Where I don't see it, can no, no, that's not that's not the issue. I mean, at this point, um, this is the case where I, where I'm stopping this and just showing you the recording um, because I don't have time to debug this right now. See, so we, we see the same thing, um, and now I'm sure that this will work, right? 
And the advantage is that I have time and don't have to uh, uh, type, so I can tell you what's happening. So we already see, saw this, right? I'm creating the runtime directory. Then create the container. Without network again, again, I'm giving it a name. And we're starting the exact same Fedora 38. Container is created. Container is initialized. Then again, we see the status is initialized here. I'm getting the PID of that container because I'm, uh, in this case, I'm going to show you uh, some of the network namespaces. So what we see now is this is the process that's actually running, right? The container isn't running, but there's this C run process which initializes the uh, uh, namespace. This also lists the namespaces that we, that we have. So um, if you have time to look at the details, you notice that the numbers are different behind this. So this means that the namespaces have in fact been created, both the user namespace and the network namespace. Right? And we can also see, and that's what this nsenter command is, is doing here now, we can now enter the namespace and look at the IP configuration inside of the namespace and we should expect that there will just be a localhost interface, interface because we told it not to set up any network. And that's what we see here, right? So there's no ETH zero, no other network connect, uh, connectivity. Now is the point where uh, I want to set up the network. So again, we see the rootful zero bridge exists. That's the bridge that I want to attach to this container. Again, the path to the container, to the runtime directory that it created, set up to tell it to set up. Rootless is the name, um, the, the secret that I use to generate the IP address. Test is the user, rootful zero um, is, the, uh, is the network name then publish because they want to publish a port and in this case I'm also specifying a network alias um, that uh, will be in the, in the DNS server inside of the container. And this is the successful output, a lot of JSON, you don't need to understand it, it just gives you the uh, network, uh, the DNS configuration and now we see if we rerun this nsenter command that the ethernet connection exists at this point. Right, and if we want to, uh, right, now we need to start it, obviously, because the, the process inside the container wasn't running yet, so I ran podman start rootless, now it's running. And now we still need to test it, because, you know, if, it, if we didn't test it, then it's broken, obviously. So I'm figuring out my own IP address um, and using curl to uh, send an HTTP request to the Python web server inside of the container, and it works. So our networking worked as expected. I'll skip the stopping because we're running out of time. Um, I also have the same thing automated with systemd. So uh, I put the exact same commands in a systemd service file and the lines that require root privileges, systemd allows you to just specify a plus at the beginning of the command and that will run them with root. So that's a nice trick to get all of this in a single systemd service file. I'd show you but we run out of time. So you'd have to go to the website where I published this um, you don't have to scan the QR code now. It will be on the last slide again, um, so no hurries. Um, and that also will contain this um, rootful network Python script that I just used um, to do this. Right? So what did we achieve so far? We now have automatic IP configuration, even though you know I had to re-implement it, but the script does it for you. Otherwise, Podman uh, would have done it. Um, we can expose ports. Um, with the systemd service file that I talked about, I can have this cont container controlled by systemd, and that takes care of con correct startup and teardown. Podman inspect still won't know about this network because we added the networking manually. 
And um, if we try to run, uh, try to use systemd notifications, that also won't work in this particular configuration because systemd will refuse the notify. It will see it, but um, it will refuse it. So what's next on this? Um, before Podman 4.5 introduced this, the, the, the working dash dash UAD map flag where this just works out of the box, I would have said maybe we should add a mode to Podman to drop all privileges except for network configuration. Now I'm not so sure. Honestly, if you're on Podman larger than 4.5, probably just use UAD map um, to do the same thing. And maybe there's some improvement to be had for rootless networking. There's a talk tomorrow at 9.30 um, on rootless less container networks get in shape with pasta. So if you uh, want to give that a shot. Right, that's it. Thank you for uh, attending and any questions. Right, the question was um, then the JSON format for NetAwark isn't documented, so probably not standardized. Am I afraid that this will break with the next NetAwark update? Yes, very. Um, on the other hand, it's also a interface across two processes between Podman and NetAwark. So um, I know those two are developed in, uh, in unison, but um, I'm at least hoping that they will preserve backward compatibility and what I'm currently doing will continue to work. It also looked like um, somebody really wanted to document uh, the JSON interface, just didn't. So I think that's the, that's the lack of time is the only reason why it wasn't documented. So the question is, um, I demonstrated that the that said UID bit um, trick won't work because it will map to the unprivileged user. What about file capabilities? I actually can't tell you. I'd have to look into the kernel source code what it does, but I'm assuming the, the rule that I learned from Michael Karist, he has a great training on all those isolation APIs. If you have a chance, attend it. Um, what I, what I learned from him is the general rule that uh, you need the permissions in the user namespace that owns what you're trying to access. And if that principle holds, then it shouldn't be possible because in the user namespace that owns the files, um, which should be the root namespace, um, you as unprivileged user wouldn't have the capability to do that. But yeah, no, I'd have to test. Other questions? Questions from the internet, maybe? Then thank you, and uh, enjoy DEF Conference.